So I'm going to now call up a couple of real leaders in the industry who've actually been able to develop that collaborative mindset and create blockchains that are working for all stakeholders, all stakeholders. So the first is a dear friend and colleague of mine, Mike White, and he is the CEO of TradeLens, and that is a joint collaboration with Maersk, IBM, and the shipping industry. And what it's about is digitizing world trade. Just that you know about 90% of what you use every day comes in the shipping industry, and we are, we are digitizing shipping. And already, this has had a major impact for us. Um, we have more than 60 members, 100 ecosystem partners, 500 million events, and 20 million containers already on the blockchain. Just to give you a sense of this, um, we are now up to around 50 to 60 ports and terminals in the world that are connected to this blockchain. And what it really is doing is allowing to, us to make shipping and the transport and logistics of good more accessible to everyone in the world and everyone in this ecosystem benefits. So, and by the way, another place where Canada is leading, the port of Halifax, was one of our very first members on this blockchain and have been an incredible supporter for us. So please come up, Mike, and join me. Thank you. Right, so they're sitting us miles apart, but um, we'll be able to see each other here. Okay, so Mike, Mike, as I've said to you, has led Trade Lens with, with, with us right from the beginning, so really has a lot of experience in this place, in this space. So in a way, shipping is very symbolic of a complex supply chain with multiple parties and multiple participants in an ecosystem. So tell us, what's the problem and what's the opportunity in global shipping? First of all, the good news, global trade is robust and it continues to grow at or slightly higher than global GDP. Despite all the rumors. News, despite <laughs> all the rumors, so that's good news. And just to put it in perspective, the, the total value of goods that are moved internationally is about $16 trillion per year. And as Bridget said, well over 80% of that moves by ocean containerized shipping. So that's good news. And as we all know, or those who are in the industry know, that global supply chains are some of the largest, most complex multi-party networks in the shipping world or in the business world today. And uh, it's not uncommon, for instance, to have over 30 different actors or entities involved in a global end-to-end -end shipment of one container. Involved in that also 100 individuals and up to 200 separate exchanges of information, documentation, or data. So the process is complex, and it's usually inefficient in its, current, in its current status. Because what that means is there is a lot of peer-to-peer -peer relationship, information is stuck in silos, processes are time consuming and more complex and therefore more expensive than they need to be. So of that $16 trillion in global commerce, it's estimated by the World Economic Forum that up to 15% is spent on the administration of information just to enable global trade. Not the physical transport, the administration. So it's a huge opportunity Incredible. for improvement. So there's a huge amount at stake in terms of being able to make that 15% much more effective and efficient, and so in, in foster inclusion and acceleration, not to manage, ma mention waste and sitting at, at, at ports because of incorrect documentation, right? That's so why, 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 why blockchain then? Why does blockchain singularly fix this issue? Well, I this think issue? blockchain is uniquely positioned to enable especially large multi-party networks sending information across organizational and geographical boundaries. It provides that immutable trust. The distributed ledger ensures that people that are involved in an end-to-end -end transaction that should have access to data have access to that data. It's a permissioned access, so the people that have access should have access, and they can trust that the information they're seeing is not only real time, but the absolute latest information regarding that shipment, and they can tell if anything's been changed, and that means that they have earlier visibility and an opportunity to, to make an impact on cargo while it's in route or to prevent delays from happening. So what's the traction been? What has have, have the industry really gotten behind and liked about this? And then what have been some of the surprises along the way? Well, I think some of the surprises or some of the learnings is, is 
It's an education. It's a voyage for all of the participants involved in this. First of all, understanding blockchain. As it becomes more and more topical, there's still a vast number of the audience that we deal with that conflate Bitcoin with blockchain and don't understand a permission blockchain which actually provides greater security, less risk. And so that's, that's one challenge that's, that's been uh, something that we, it's a communication journey I would say as well. The other challenge is with blockchain, it enables not only different solutions but a different business model. Mm -hmm. So we're talking mm -hmm. about an open, neutral industry platform so all members, Bridget talked a little bit about ports and terminals, and we have 54 terminals connected, another 60 that are in the process of being connected, but also inland providers, rails, truckers, barge operators, other ocean carriers, uh, customs authorities. So you have all these entities coming together, and sometimes it's competitors coming together in a platform, and, that, and that's something that's a little bit different. So it's we'll sort need, of counterintuitive right? from how they've worked before. But the advantage of connecting one too many, of everybody seeing real time the information that's related to shipments that they're involved in, and also getting visibility to the documents or the digital data from those documents is really a game changer. And blockchain supports it and provides that immutable trust. Yeah, so, so it's interesting watching role by role these participants get their, their, their head around the everybody benefits and everyone needs to benefit. And, and part of the blockchain, I think, is building that benefit for every participant, right? That, that each one has to get something out of it. Absolutely. Uh, for this to, to realize its full potential, all ecosystem members, so all the people that are providing data to support the rest of the participants, they need to extract as much value as they get by putting data into it. And it is one where everybody who's involved can, can benefit from this. I've talked to many terminal operators, port authorities. Again, the Port of Halifax and the Port of Montreal have been two leading institutions. Uh, getting earlier information further upstream helps them manage their physical assets, birth availability, managing their yard, being able to plan for peak season. So everybody who participates gets value out of this. And of course, the end consumer, the shippers, the large auto manufacturers, the packaged good customers that are on board, get to have more control, more visibility of the information regarding their supply chain, and ultimately better efficiency. Because once data is entered into the platform, it never has to be rekeyed. Yeah. So if you were to calibrate for the audience what progress you think we've made on this blockchain, just to net that out, and then what's next? So in the past 15 months since we launched Trade Lens, we're pleased to say, as, as Bridget mentioned, over 500 million events. That's a million and a half events per day, or 1,100 per minute, so quite a bit of, of, uh, of events that are coming into the system. Also, every day, 25 to 30,000 documents are now part of this, of this ecosystem. We continue to expand uh, with uh, ecosystem participants, the terminals, the inland providers we talked about, but also customs are now getting involved. Again, customs authorities, have the same issues that many of the other businesses are grappling with. Trying to get better information earlier upstream, static workforce, ever growing volumes of trade, and being able to be able to make risk assessments earlier in the process to be able to look at the shipments that they're concerned with without impeding global, global trade. And right here in Canada, CBSA is in the midst of a pilot with Livingston International Custom Broker, with the Port of Montreal, with several shippers and, and importers and also connecting with other customs authorities. So we have eight different government custom authorities involved in this already. And just last week, we were pleased to announce the addition of Zimline. So another global carrier has joined. So we have six carriers in total as part of this platform and over 20% of global containerized trade as we speak. It's a journey, but it's a journey worth making. And, and Mike, I, I want to thank you. And um, you know, just for the audience, um, you know, just in terms of leadership, one of, one of, as I said, one of the biggest transitions. Look at the height difference. You can see he works for a Viking company, yes. and I, yes. <laughs> I work for an Italian East Coast company. I don't know what to say. Um, we, when I talked about the difference in mind, mindset, um, one of the 
the most important things that Mike touched on is MERS could not be seen as benefiting at the expense of other carriers or other participants in the industry. And it really took an effort to show this was a win-win for everyone. And you really role modeled and led that. And so, you know, this is, that is the kind of leadership it will take. Well, we truly chain. believe it. And we think the future is, is yet ahead of us. Uh, it is it indeed. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you.